Section 23 of The Age of Elizabeth by Mandel Creighton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Book 7, Chapter 2, Elizabethan Literature, Part 1. Amid the varied activity of Elizabeth's reign, English literature burst forth in its most vigorous form. No subject is more profitless for speculation than an attempt to assign the causes for literary activity. But one thought certainly suggests itself. Literature is concerned with the expression of individual thought, and the age which from any circumstances or conditions forces upon man the conception of his own individual power and force, prompts him also to express that conception in the most forcible language. We have seen how the age of Elizabeth brought upon England a consciousness of its national greatness, and awoke in the minds of individual Englishmen a feeling of their own power. Men felt the greatness of the world, and the importance of the issues before them. They felt also in those adventurous days how much each man could do for himself. Their ambition was boundless, and success awaited their own courage or cleverness or address. They felt their own importance, and they knew their own strength. Moreover, with increased leisure and increased comfort, men had more time for cultivation. The revival of letters which had begun in Italy in the preceding century had been slow in taking root in England. The troubled times had prevented the spread of learning, and Germany and France had advanced more rapidly than England. Grammar schools had been established by Henry VIII and Edward VI, and slowly produced their fruit. But under Mary, learning had decayed. The universities were almost at their lowest point, for knowledge was sacrificed to disputation, and the fear of persecution cramped the freedom of thought. Under Elizabeth, the universities at once began to revive. The Queen was most anxious for their progress and encouraged them by her presence. The influence of Italian literature soon made itself felt in England. Already under Henry VIII had sprung up two courtly makers, as Putnam called them, the Earl of Surrey and Sir Thomas Wyatt, who having travelled into Italy and there tasted the sweet and stately measures of the Italian poesy, greatly polished our rude and homely manner. They introduced the sonnet, so well adapted to the expression of amorous conceits, which since then has held the chief place among our forms of poetical composition. Surrey also introduced blank verse in his translations of the second and fourth books of Virgil's Aeneid. Translations rapidly increased in number. Harrington translated Ariosto's Orlando Furioso, Fairfax, Tasso's Jerusalem Delivered, and Chapman, Homer's Iliad. There was a greater desire for knowledge about England's past history. Archbishop Parker set an example of diligence in rescuing from destruction the records and documents which had been dispersed by the dissolution of the monasteries. Hollinshed, aided by Harrison and others, compiled his chronicles, which show at all events a larger interest than had yet been felt. Stowe was a diligent antiquary who travelled on foot through England to examine manuscripts and whose survey of London is still the source of our knowledge of the early history of that city. With true antiquarian zeal, Stowe wasted his substance, neglected his business, and spent all his money in his favourite pursuit. At the accession of James I, we find him reduced to want in his old age and receiving from the king a permission to ask alms from the churches. Hacklet was so impressed with the geographical value of the voyages then being made by the English that he collected and published the narratives of travellers. As Elizabeth's reign went on, inquiry increased and took a broader form. William Camden, headmaster of Westminster School, published his Britannia, an antiquarian geography of Britain. After Elizabeth's death, he wrote a history of her reign which shows a great advance upon previous contemporary analysts in breadth of view and political insight. Daniel's History of England, Knoll's History of the Turks, and Sir Walter Raleigh's History of the World show an enlarged conception of historical writing, which was altogether new in England, 
and from which the rise of critical history can really be traced. The influence of Italian models was not entirely beneficial. All conscious efforts at imitation lead to affectation and pedantry. Too great attention to style makes words be valued at the expense of thought. Obscurity took the place of clearness, and the desire to clothe a thought in a recondite image or far-fetched illusion was stronger than the wish to express the thought itself. Some of the simpler writers in the early part of Elizabeth's reign complained bitterly of these foreign affectations. Roger Ascombe, the tutor of Elizabeth and Lady Jane Grey, in vain lays down the rule, he that will write well in any tongue must speak as the common people do, and think as wise men do, so should every man understand him and the judgment of wise men allow him. Many English writers have not done so, but using strange words as Latin, French, and Italian do make all things dark. Ask him himself, a man of strong common sense, was Elizabeth's Latin secretary. He is known as the author of The Schoolmaster, the first treatise on classical education in the English language, and of Toxophilus, an elegant little dialogue on archery. Again, Thomas Wilson tried by his criticisms of style to stop the obscurity of expression which came from following foreign models extravagantly. Some seek so far outlandish English that they forget altogether their mother's language. Some far journeyed gentlemen at their return home, like as they love to go in foreign apparel, so will they powder their talk in oversea language. The mystical wise men and poetical clerks will speak nothing but quaint proverbs and blind allegories, delighting much in their own darkness, especially when none can tell what they do say. This affected style reached its highest point in Lively's Romance of Euphues, published in 1579. The story is but slight, and is concerned with a young Athenian gentleman who lives first at Naples and then in England. It is used merely as a thread to bind together a number of remarks and reflections on love, education, friendship, and other points. The style is antithetical and inflated, but there is much fineness of thought running through the book. It was written for ladies. You fewies had rather lie shut in a lady's casket than open in a scholar's study. In this aspiration, Lyly succeeded. The ladies of the court all became his scholars. A new style of speaking, called after its founder Euphuism, became fashionable, and long prevailed among the courtiers. Shakespeare satirized Euphuism in his earliest play, Love's Labor's Lost, in the character of the superfine Don Armado, while in Hollow Fernies he shows us the other tendency towards pedantry, which was engaged in spoiling the English tongue. Euphuism owed its great success to the patronage of the queen. It suited Elizabeth's character to express herself in quaint conceits, which by their length seemed to be a careful statement, while through their obscurity they were without meaning. To be decorous and impressive without committing herself decidedly to any definite action was exactly what Elizabeth delighted in. Sir Philip Sidney marked the return to a soberer and more straightforward style. Sidney's earliest literary effort was a mask, The Queen of the May, in which the pedantic and affected talk was caricatured and ridiculed. His romance of Arcadia was written immediately after the appearance of Lyly's Euphues, but showed a great advance in manner of composition. The story was more continuous and the teaching was not so much conveyed by direct moralizing as by the incidents and situations of the story itself. The setting, however, is a perplexing mixture of chivalrous and classical surroundings, and though Sidney ridiculed pedantry, he could not avoid many extravagances and much that is far-fetched both in style and matter. Perhaps the only pure work of Elizabeth's time which has escaped the prevailing affectation is Sidney's Defense of Poesy, a noble and graceful treatise on the power of imagination and a vindication as against the Puritan tendencies of the time of its lawful uses. Nature never set forth the earth in so rich tapestry as divers poets have done, neither with so pleasant rivers, 
fruitful trees sweet-smelling flowers nor whatsoever else may make the too much loved earth more lovely her world is brazen the poets only deliver a golden i never heard the old song of percy and douglas that i found not my heart moved more than with a trumpet in passages such as these we feel the fullness of joy in life and beauty the depth and quickness of feeling the nobility and force of spirit which enabled the men of elizabeth's time to do great things both in life and literature english prose writing went on through a course of purification and amplification throughout elizabeth's reign putnam's art of poesy which appeared in fifteen eighty nine was an attempt at serious criticism its author tries to mediate between pedantry and barbarism to show how the english language may be enriched without being encumbered but the practical example how this could be achieved was given by francis bacon whose essays first published in fifteen ninety seven show a mixture of fancy and clearness which was new in english literature these brief notes set down significantly rather than curiously as their author says of them show the effect which the political life of elizabeth's time had exercised in maturing reflection and calling into life political wisdom they are full of pregnant remarks on government they show a keen analysis of the laws of the forces at work in human society and the motives by which men are influenced in their common actions they are incisive clear and condensed bacon had freed himself from all affected forms of expression his imagination is fervent yet restrained his imagery is abundant yet carefully selected with a view to clearness he is grave serious and thoughtful his language is chosen to give force and clearness to his thought his style is not yet quite easy or flowing but it is concise and dignified bacon's essays will always rank as one of the standard models of english style but bacon has a still greater place in english literature he first clearly set forth the claims of inductive philosophy as against the old methods of metaphysical speculation he asserted that knowledge was to be found by careful investigation of nature not by spinning cobwebs of the brain he turned men from disputations of words to an observation of the world around them bacon's method was faulty as was natural for a beginner but modern science has still to point to him as the man who first brought into due prominence the principles on which its method was to be founded his great work in which these ideas were first set forth was not published until sixteen twenty but it marks the fruits which the increased knowledge of the world in elizabeth's reign had been slowly bearing in a thoughtful mind End of section 23